Let's open in a word of prayer. Father, again, we do thank you that we can come together to look at your word about things that sometimes we take for granted, especially at this church. Ron said it best when he said that we're a well-taught church, uh, and we're just so blessed of that. And so, Father, just help us to become aware of some things that are subtle in the Christian life, that are subtle, especially when it comes to, to the gospel presentation, that are just wrong. And so, Father, I just pray that you encourage us with this message, and I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, I'm, I'm, I went to my high school reunion in, in 2015, and uh, out of that reunion came a, uh, a, a group of friends that we reconnected, about a dozen of us, and we used the Facebook Messenger group to speak, I and mean, we were constantly talking to each other about something. And uh, one of them, back during this past election in December, one of them sent a message that uh, where they actually saw somebody else post something, and they wanted to see my reaction to it because I'm the preacher of the group. And it said, um, and you can, and I'm not getting political, by the way. You can fill in any name you want. But it said, there's no way you can call yourself a Christian and vote for Roy Moore. And they, and immediately it said, so what do you think about that, Tony? And my response, I started to answer it, and then my response was, what do y'all think about it? Because they're all believers, they're all, and they're all pretty conservative, pretty good Bible students. And so I said, well, yeah, let's, let's discuss this. What do y'all think about that before I answer it? I had something similar said by one of our kids from our teen Bible study, at, at this, in, also in December. They said that uh, you can't be homosexual and be a Christian. And it kind of fell in that same vein. Uh, and, you know, unfortunately, that poor child, when they said that, I started trying to teach them. And the more I spoke, the higher the octaves in my voice got. Uh, to where Sherry said, you're hollering at that child. <laughs> and, and I literally apologized to, to her because I didn't mean to do that. But it's, it's just one of those things where there's so much error, especially when it comes to the gospel, it just drives me crazy sometimes. And it's, and it's really, it's coming into the Christ, Christianity in waves. And it's, uh, you know, and, and uh, unfortunately, I hate to say this, and I don't want to paint a, too broad of a brush, but I'm starting to see in our Baptist friends a lot of it. It's, uh, Ron touched on it the first half, you know, um, lordship salvation. He was talking about James where, you know, uh, you got to be saved by grace, but you got to work for spirituality. Well, with lordship salvation, it's almost become you're, you're saved by grace, but prove it. Let's see your works. If you don't have your works, you must not be saved. You know, if Jesus isn't lord of all, he's not lord at all. That's the whole idea behind that. And that's kind of what was coming out of those two statements that was made, that you know, uh, you can't vote for fill in the blank and call yourself a Christian. Well, yeah, you can too. Because you're, you know, I, I, I finally got involved in the, in the answer to the, to the question that was posed. And it's like, you know, you do this to become a Christian, put your faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. You do this to grow as a Christian. And they're two completely separate issues and two separate things. So you can't say, if you do this, you're not this. Because the other side of that coin is, is what if you do this, but you never did this? You, you're as lost as could be, as lost as Hogan's goat, as Ron has said all these years, whoever Hogan's goat is. So this, this whole thing kind of got, got that ball rolling. And then Ron asked me to write a lesson for uh, this past soteriology class that they're just wrapping up. And this lesson is one of those out of that, I, you know, I hate that he, he, I got to write this lesson and I didn't get to teach it. You know, I, it's, I, and I really, I thoroughly enjoyed writing it. I would write it, I would send it to him. He'd send it back, I'd write it again, I'd send it to him. He'd send it back, I'd write it again. You know, he would give me a, he'd say, that's good what you've got, but add this verse. Well, I would add that verse and I'd read it and i think, oh boy. And they'd say, I know, I'm writing two more paragraphs in the lesson. And then I would send it to David to get all the grammar and everything corrected. But I did, I had a great time. The book. You know, we're looking at some, we're going to look today at some of the common fallacies in the presentation of the gospel. Confusion abounds with respect to both the content and presentation of the gospel. Some do not pre present it purely, some do not present it clearly, some do not present it with us sincerely, but because God is gracious, He often gives light in spite of our imprecise witness. Uh, I want to look first at the fallacy that the gospel primarily, uh, let's see, the uh, look at the fallacy that the gospel primarily concerns other issues than the sin issue. 
And when I say the sin issue, I'm not talking about personal sin. I'm talking about imputed sin. You know, you got Adam. Went, <coughs> when he went, <coughs> however he did it, sin came upon all mankind. That's imputed sin. And that's what separates us God and, from God and was sending us to hell that made us unrighteous. Um, in some kind of, of a correctness approach to the gospel, sin and hell are being left out of the presentation. There can be no good news if there's no bad news. There can be no good news for the person who does not sense that he needs the good news of the gospel of grace salvation. And there can be no sense of need without some uh, realization that sin of, of sin and its consequences. Again, not personal sin, but imputed sin. You know, I don't expect us to run out and theologically teach unbelievers about imputed sin and personal sin and original sin and, you know, sin nature and all that, but, but we need to understand that because that's what we're dealing with when we talk about that. Sin can have many symptoms that can alert an individual to the basic problem, which is sin separating us from the righteousness of God. That imputed sin, as we know in Romans 5.12, because of one man's sin, sin entered the world, and death by sin, and death was passed upon all mankind because all men sin. That's what separates us from God. The gospel presentation can focus on lack of joy, lack of peace, or a need of help in solving problems. But these are symptoms of imputed sin that keep us from God. These are not why we need to be saved. These are benefits of being saved. And yet, you'll hear, you know, you, you've heard the term prosperity gospel. Get saved and God is going to pour all these blessings on you. That's not why you get saved. That is not why you get saved. Uh, it's a benefit of it. Maybe. He may do it. He may not. He may not. But... <clears throat> the, believe, uh, the believed gospel solves the imputed sin problem. 2 Corinthians 5.21, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Another fallacy is that there are differing gospels for differing groups of people. There is not one gospel for children, another for young people, and yet another for adults. Uh, there's not one for unchurched people and one for people with a church background. There's one gospel. Christ died on the cross for the sin of the world. They took his dead body and they buried it, and God raised him from the dead. He did that for us. That's a personal thing that he did for us as individuals. You know, we got to get the gospel down to a personal level. Jesus died for me. I used to do this thing with, with the teens. You know, I'd go back to the, to the Michael Jackson song, We Are the World. Well, who is we? You and me. Okay, well, let's throw out the you part, and let's just focus on the me part. Teenagers have a problem doing that sometimes, you know. But, but, but let's focus on the me part. That's what this is about. It's got to come down to a personal relationship between you and the Lord. Um, there may be different ways of explaining the gospel to different groups, but unless the content is the same, these different explanations may create an incorrect gospel. Different words may, need to be, uh, may, may be needed. But for those different words should convey the same gospel message. Paul addressed this in 2 Corinthians 11.4. He says, For if one comes and preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or you received a different spirit which you, which, uh, you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. You may well bear it beautifully, is how the New, uh, New American Standard says. So we got to be careful that, that we understand that there is only one message. There's differing groups. You can talk to them different ways. You know, I, I heard, once heard a, a biker, a, a motorcycle biker evangelist guy with long hair and the tattoos and the leather and all that, saying there's no way he could go to Wall Street and they would listen to the word he's got to say. His ministry is to who God has given him to in the biker community. Uh, but the message would be the same. The message would be the same. Another fallacy is that there are different... Uh, that, um, that the truth can come from another source other than the Word of God. That's hogwash. You know, experience can confirm or deny truth, but it does not create infallible truth. Neither does archaeology, neither does apologetics. Uh, in our teen Bible study, I, I, sometimes I'll pose to the kids, what would you like me to teach next? And it came up once, uh, let's do apologetics. And I tried my best to teach apologetics, and I just could not do it. Could not do it. Because I got to the point, apologetics is, is proving. 
And I'm all about faith. I mean, that's what it comes down to. I, I finally, I, po- I had to pose the question to myself, and I actually posed it to Gary and some folks at, at break, prayer, prayer breakfast one time, but I said, tell me how you can prove Christ, prove the gospel, apart from the Bible. Take the Bible out. Now tell me, show me how to prove it. Well, you know, we had somebody, you know, about, let's say for Christ's resurrection, there was 400 witnesses. All right, but you got that out of the Word of God. Throw that out. You can't do that. At some point, we have got to come to the point where we've got to believe this, and the only way to believe is by faith. That's where we get our information from, and that's where we then move into the gospel because the gospel is about faith. So, yeah, I mean, archaeology may back this up. Some form of apologetics, and I'm not the guy for that, but some form, I mean, there's some really good people into apologetics. I'm just not that person. But they may back this up, but they are not to replace the Word of God. The Word of God is the only place we're going to get the source for the information we need for salvation, for the gospel message. And it comes down to, are, by faith, are you going to believe that this information is true, that it is of God? Because if you can't believe that, you're not going to believe anything else. So... This idea of let's come up with a different source of information about Jesus or a better source about Jesus, you know, that, that's a fallacy. Um, Acts 13.5 says, When they reached Salmas, they began to proclaim the word of God in the synagogues and of the Jews. In, verse, in chapter 17, verse 2, it says, and, uh, and in his custom was Paul went to the synagogue and on uh, three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the Scriptures. It's always about teaching the Word of God. It's always about reasoning out the Scriptures. But let me tell you something. You better know them before you start trying to reason with them because people can throw some crushed questions at you that you don't see coming. And you better know the Word of God. You absolutely... Of course, I'm pre- preaching to the choir here. But if you don't know the Word of God and you try to get into, re- reason, quote, reasoning out the Scriptures or whatever the topic may be, there's pretty sharp folks out there that's going to throw something your way. Another fallacy is cleverness and personality or celebrity will convict. Ron, thank you for a verse you gave me the first half in regards to this. If the convincing ministry of the Spirit is to set the truth of the gospel before the unsaved person in such a light that he must acknowledge it as truth, then this must be done by the Holy Spirit. Celebrity can't do it. Uh, That James 2, 1 and 2 passage is where it talks about the sin of partiality, where you want to say, you know, boy, I really would love to have, we kind of fall into this at camp sometimes, or you'll see this with these winter jam concerts. Boy, I'd really love to have Rick and Bubba come out and give the gospel, because they'll believe Rick and Bubba. Or, or, I mean, even Gary Horton, I'd really love to have Gary Horton do it. You know, yeah, I can give the gospel, but man, Gary is, he's, he's a big deal. Or, or fill in the blank. I mean, cut, name a name. That's not what it's about. You don't have to have that for a gospel presentation. You do, you've got to have the information. And guess what? You've got to have the Holy Spirit driving it. If the Holy Spirit is driving that information, who says it? You're just a, you know, what, what a, God can use any old stick. You know, there's, that, there's a lot of truth. There's absolute truth to that. So this idea of, of needing a celebrity or a big personality or, or being clever in some way, uh, if it could, uh, is, is just, it's a fallacy. Our presentation should be well prepared and well presented, uh, but, when these, but these do not guarantee that anyone will be convicted. The Holy Spirit must do that. If we look at John 16, verse 8, it says, When he comes, the Holy Spirit, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. That's what his job is. And, and, and it makes the person doing the evangelizing, quote, job so much easier. I'm here to give you this information. The Holy Spirit's going to do the conviction. And, and one of the things, the great things that I, I got cleared up for my own self when, when I was teaching or when I was preparing this, all these lessons, I, I finally came to understand conviction. You know, I thought conviction was a, almost a nagging. Are you going to do it? Are you going to do it? Are you going to do it? Are you going? But the conviction means to... Make a, an issue so clear that they cannot, they cannot deny it. They may reject it, but they cannot deny it. You know, you're, you, here's the information. I've made it to you absolutely clear that sun's shining out there today. You, you could say it's not, but it is, and you know it is. 
So what it does when they reject Christ and they stand in the, in, in the throne room and, and God says, your name's not in the Lamb's book of life, you can't say, I didn't know. You cannot say that. Another fallacy is that charm will ensure results. We should not be offensive as to dress, speech, or culture, but the moment we announce the gospel, we take on the offense of the cross. Huh. Boy, see, you see that a lot. At least I do. I see that a lot. You know, you, you bring up Jesus, people are offended. You know, the offense of the cross. That's, I love that statement. Uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't say anything to hurt your feelings. I just said I'm a Christian, or I just said I believe in the gospel, or, you know, oh, that's offensive. That's the offense of the cross, and that's what, that's, if we're going to take on any offense, that would be the one to take on. You know, I've always said that one of the luxuries Christians don't have is offending other people or to make other people mad because there's going to come a time where we may be called on to have some kind of ministry with that person. And if I've hurt their feelings or I've made them mad or something in the past, I'm the last person they're going to listen to or they're going to want to talk to. So if, if I am going to offend somebody, I'm going to, I'm, it's going to be the offense of the cross. The, the rest of it, you know, I'm just, I'm not going to go down, down that road. I'm not, going to, I'm not there to, to say something that, or do something that is going to offend you in a way to where you're not going to hear the words that's coming, that God has placed on my heart. or we hear what the Holy Spirit is saying through me. Um, the salvation message can be a stumbling block. In Paul's case, uh, in Acts 15, in Paul's uh, case, the problem was with those hearing Christ preach preferred the law. Uh, today, grace offends those who prefer works salvation. While the grace message may offend, the messenger should not. At the same time, being pleasant and charming does not convert people. Another fallacy is that procedures produce conversion. Procedures do produce results, but results are not always the same as conversions. Chuck Farmer told me one time, when I first got into evangelism, he said, uh, you do realize that when you go out to speak, a lot of times it's to condemn. It's to, to give the gospel and allow that person to reject it so that, again, when they stand at whatever that point is in their life, they, say, they, they, say, I, they can't say, I didn't know. Yeah, you did know. Tony told you. You rejected it. So in many cases, when we give the gospel, it is to condemn. You know, we hope not, but it's up to the volition of the person that's hearing it. <clears throat> so don't think that, that your presentation is going to produce conversions. All it's going to do is produce results. Salvation, uh, a, a rejection, uh, a point in their life now where there's conviction going on. You know, conviction is something that happens like that, or it may happen a year over years and years. I, I talked about that not long ago, but it just depends on the, the plan of God. He may give this person years to make the decision. He may give this person seconds to make the decision. It's, it's, he knows better than all of us. Another fallacy that... Um, Oh, I'm sorry, uh, a good test for any gospel message. Did the presenter give the listener something to believe or did the presenter give them something to do? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Get baptized and thou shalt be saved. Walk this aisle and thou shalt be saved. I mean, did you give them something to believe or did you give them something to do? Because it's, John, John loved that word, believe. Believe, believe, believe. He, he used that word probably more in the book of John than it was used throughout the rest of the New Testament. It was all about faith in Christ, believe. You know, whoever, whosoever believes will not perish. <clears throat> Jesus gives a great message in Matthew regarding conversions. In Matthew 13, 3 through 9, it's the, the, sower, the parable of the sower. It says, Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed, and he was scattering the seed. Some fell on the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly, but because the soil was shallow, but when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. 
Still other seed fell on good soil, for it produced a crop, a hundred, sixty, and thirty times what was sown. Whosoever has ears, let them hear. His message was to the hearer, not to the sower. Whosoever has ears, let them hear. Uh, the hearing leads to believing, not doing. You hear the message, and by faith, you process it, you choose to believe it. Nowhere in here does it say, hearer, do this, hear or do that. So you always ask yourself when you hear a, a gospel, you know, I let, I let people sometimes try to evangelize me when they come up. They want to, you know, hey, tell me about your faith or do you know Jesus or whatever, and I let them go through the gospel presentation just to see what they got to say. Are they asking me to believe or are they asking me to do? <clears throat> Some fallacies about the content of the gospel. One fallacy is adding baptism to the gospel. While baptism is an important Christian ordinance, it is not part of the gospel. It is, uh, to include it in the gospel is to add a work to the grace of God. Many theologians do not believe that. Uh, if you look at Mark 16, verses 9 through 20, uh, Ron has taught this before, and that's where they get a lot of this about you have to be baptized to be saved, but that's not even in the original scriptures. So you've got to be careful when you quote verses like that. Uh, in many Bibles, you see that they're written in italics. Baptism throughout the New Testament is either referring to a spiritual baptism of the Holy Spirit, uh, one of the works of the believer's life after salvation, or water baptism, which was an outward testimony as a result of being saved. John the Baptist used it to identify Christ. We use it to identify believers, and, and as an evangelism, we use it at camp as an evangelism tool because it never fails when a child gets baptized, family going to come out and watch it. We get an opportunity to give the gospel. Uh, but we never present baptism as a part of salvation. We make that very clear to these kids when we do baptisms. It can. Uh, there's a, fall a fallacy or misunderstanding about repentance, metanoia. Repentance means a genuine change of mind that affects the life in some way. Repentance, and in many cases, can be... Uh, the save, or can be for the saved more than the unsaved, it is best defined by asking a specific question, namely, change your mind about what? Um, repentance can be part of the salvation process, but it doesn't have to be. Sometimes people just need to change their mind about, I mean, they could be from some, like Muslim or something, some, some religion where they just absolutely don't believe anything about Jesus or, or atheist or whatever. So there's got to be a changing in a the mind there. Sometimes it may be a very subtle. In, in the Bible Belt, we grow up hearing about Jesus, and, and you know we grow up in churches, and so we have a pretty good understanding about Jesus, and there's a point in our life where we've actually got to put our faith in the gospel. So there may be this little subtle change. That would be repentance. But to say you've got to repent to be saved, especially when they define repentance as turning from sin, um, that's way off base way off base. And so we got to be careful when you use words like that. Is repentance part of it? Could be. Does it need to be? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. It's always, always about faith. Um, <clears throat> the fallacy of surrendering your life as part of the gospel is growing in leaps and bounds. That's another one, surrendering your life. I'm not opposed to surrendering your life. It's a great thing, but that's part of the Christian walk. That's part we do as Christians as we grow spiritually, as we take in the Word of God and we start applying the Word of God and we allow the ministry of the Holy Spirit to work through us. We see that's a much better life and that's what I need to surrender to and allow to function in my life all the time. Not surrendering my life at the point of salvation and that's how I get saved. Now you're getting back into a work salvation. Uh, David gave me a quote this morning that I really liked. It says, if God's, excuse me, if good works can't get you into heaven, and most of these people that talk this stuff, they, they espouse a grace salvation, they think. But he says, if good works can't get you into heaven, why would your good works keep you there? And yet, that's what they, they, process, they, they push. You know, good works, if you don't have them, you are never saved to start with because you haven't surrendered your life. Surrendering your life is a process. It's called spiritual growth. 
It's called taking in the Word of God and applying the Word of God and over and over and over and over and over. It's not a, it's this, this thing about, you know, I'm going to surrender my life to Jesus and be saved. That is so not biblical. And yet it sounds so good. Sounds wonderful. I, I, I saw this guy on a, on a video recently. Uh, a young guy, probably mid-30s, very slick and polished and, you know, athletic and looking. And he got up, and, and it when I was flipping through and I saw this video, I saw the title of it was, a lot of people that are in churches are going to wake up in hell one day. And that kind of grabbed my attention because I do believe that, but I believe it based on the fact that they're not believing a true gospel. So I played the video, and within 60 seconds, this guy was going on and on about how you're not saved if you don't surrender your life. You're not saved if there's any disobedience at all. If you're, if you're going to church and you're sitting in that pew every Sunday and you're living a life of total disobedience, you're not saved. You know, that, I don't know where you get that stuff. You can create it. You can take, you can pick and choose scriptures, especially you can go to the book of James and you can try that stuff. But it is so not biblical. It is so, and it's definitely not gospel. Again, you're taking this area over here of accepting Christ as your Savior by faith, and you're taking this area over here, and you're saying, now I've got to walk by faith and not by sight and grow in the, grow in the Word of God and become a spiritual person and become a spiritually mature person. And you're saying, this has got to be part of this. That is not true. That is, that is a lie right out of the devil's mouth. But that's what, that's what Satan wants. He wants confusion. Because to do this, to get this, is tough. You mean i got to become a good person in order to get on Jesus' team? I've got to stop doing this to get on Jesus' team? Huh. <laughs> I like doing this. I don't want to stop doing that. You know, because they don't understand there's a ministry, a power in the Holy Spirit that can easily overcome this stuff if we allow it and we learn how to use it and learn how to, to apply it. That's right out of his mouth. That's, that, that stuff is not true, and yet it is being permeated within the Christian church in leaps and bounds. Uh, Paul states in, in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15, verses 3 and 4, he says he was buried, proof of death, uh, resurrection is not so impressive if no one is not if there's no one there to be resurrected. Uh, that he was raised on the third day. Uh, this is the elements of the gospel. He died for the. He, he said in verses th uh, three and four that he died for sin according to the scripture. Was buried and raised again the third day. That those three elements are what makes up this part of the gospel. We all know that. We've heard that and hear more times than we can count. They're taking that out, or they're, at, they're leaving the little of that in and adding this, this Christian walk in to that and saying you've got to combine the two in order to have salvation. And these are a lot of the fallacies that we're seeing that we're facing out there today, that, and it's said in subtle ways. It's not said like, you know, you've got to work to be saved. It's saying you can't vote for Roy Moore if you and call yourself Christian. Because now if you start thinking about that, well, why not? Because now you're incorporating works. Or you can't, you can't commit this sin and call yourself a Christian. But God made provisions for carnality in, in this part of the Christian. I mean, you know, he gave us, he gave us 1 John 1, 9. He, he gave us verses where he's made provisions for when we are carnal, while we're going through that growing process, while we're choosing the, the sin of this world over the things of, the, of heaven. And so they take that and they combine the two and they're just, it, it's... So that's what we're seeing. That's what we're facing, and that's, that's some of the things that, that have, are come across my desk, so to speak. And it, it's subtle. You've got to really listen for it sometimes. Uh, but what you're hearing is works salvation. It may not be works to get saved, but it's works to prove you're saved. And if you can't prove you're saved from works, you are never saved. And, boy, that's a lie right out of the devil's mouth. And it's causing so much confusion and so much heartache. Um, that, poor little, that poor little girl that was in my youth group at the house that made that statement about you can't be homosexual and be saved, when I finally calmed down and I was trying to prove to her from the scriptures, I got to thinking, I feel sorry for this child because she's got to go back to her church and her youth group and her home who probably is teaching this. So now she's in the middle. Well, who do I believe? I believe... Tony, who I think the world of, or do I believe my youth 
whoever, or my parents that I think the world of. And, and that, you know, that kind of thing bothers me because that's part of teaching these kids is they're getting so much just hammered from so many different areas, and, and all we can do is just give them truth and hope that they grasp onto it. But, you know, anyway, that's another story for another day. <clears throat> uh, I'm out of time. I thank you, Ron, for letting me come in and speak today. Um, I just want to share with you real quick, we're starting a home Bible study tonight at formerly Peggy Baxter, now Peggy, Peggy Benefield's home. It's in Trustful. If you're interested in coming, uh, just contact me and I'll get you the information how to get there. Uh, she's actually going to do a meal starting at 5 o'clock, so if you want to eat, especially get in touch with me so she can prepare enough food. We don't need a uh, five loaves and two fishes episode there, so... Uh, but if you want to just come for the Bible study, it'll start somewhere around 5.45 to 6 o'clock. And I can get you all the information on how to get there if you're interested. Uh, let's close in a word of prayer and then Rick do the pledge. And Father, again, we just thank you so much for your grace and for your mercy and for your blessings and for truth. We especially thank you for truth. I, we just pray, Father, that we never deviate from it, that we always hold up statements that we hear in the world and compare them to the Word of God. Uh, And we pray, Father, that the Word of God always wins out in our souls. It's got to. It has got to. Otherwise, we're going to get sucked into something that is just going to cause a lot of heartache and hardship and frustration. And so, Father, I just pray that you encourage us with your Word, that you you constantly teach us and constantly, constantly help us to be aware of what's going on. We thank you, we love you, and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.